Hello everyone. Uh, I'm very happy to be here today and I see that there's already 34 questions asked uh, by people who are no doubt early birds uh, in this platform. So while we sort out the technical difficulties of presentation, uh, let's see what's happening here. So, um, in case you missed the instruction, uh, and if you have a phone, uh, please connect to this website, slido.com, on your mobile phone's browser. Uh, and I see people have laptops here too, so your laptop browser as well. Uh, and uh, once you're in here, please type in today's date, that is 3, 2, 9. And um, in here, um, while people identify uh, themselves, like uh, our colleagues, uh, Wang Chaoying and Wang Shiping, um, there are also people who choose to remain anonymous. And it is okay to remain anonymous uh, because we found that if we ask everybody to have to uh, enter your names, sometimes uh, we ask, get asked questions that are more um, um, regular, let's say that. But if uh, people can uh, become anonymous, sometimes we get more challenging, more interesting questions. So um, if you have two browsers, you can use two browsers, one to ask uh, questions anonymously and one to ask uh, with your own name. And so um, let's just dive into the questions. And as the moderator said, um, the time structure is as follows. For the next 50 minutes or so, I will answer all the questions ranked uh, from the ones with the most likes to the one with the least number of likes. So if you want to see some question answered before the other questions, simply press like on the, um, on the like button next to the question, and the question with the higher number of likes will flow to the top. Um, and after we take a short, maybe 10 minute break, uh, we will then resume the same uh, question and answer format until the time runs out. And so without further ado, um, and it is exactly uh, 7 p.m., uh, let's get into the first question uh, the four people uh, has um, wanted to ask. How does corporate social responsibility, or CSR, and corporate innovation complement each other? This is a great question. Um, and to answer this question, uh, I would like to show you this uh, picture. Um, this picture, is, in my mind, um, is what our government, our public service, the administration, looks like in my mind after I finish reading this very important book called Democratic Governance, Min Zhu Zhili, by our Professor Chen Denyuan, now in Taichung. Um, and uh, in, in that book, which is like a standard public administration textbook, which I read uh, for one entire month, I bring with myself only that book when I was traveling in Paris after I become appointed additional minister, but before I actually go into the office. So uh, I spent one month studying Professor Chen's work. And in my mind, after reading that book, uh, it occurred to me that the public service, that's all of us here, um, are like this rope between those two things. Um, in the sense that, maybe I should switch the microphone. In the sense that um, we, in the previous centuries, democratic governance <laughs> model, governments are supposed to be the arbitrator between the different interests in the society. We collect resources, we reallocate resources, and we try to make sure that allocation is fair, that people don't hurt each other, that it is a safe playground for all the puppies. Uh, and so it is a pretty good picture, actually, at the time. Um, the various interests, the ones for labor, the ones for capital, the ones for environment, and so on, um, maybe they have different sides. But the government is strong enough to maintain the connection as well as the resilience of the playing field. However, all this changed around 10 years ago. Um, 10 years ago, we see the invention of the mobile internet, of the mobile phone, uh, of the social media. 
And with those new tools, suddenly people feel much closer to each other. They no longer need traditional journalists. They no longer need a MP. They no longer need any representatives. Um, but they can organize very quickly on the internet and amass thousands, tens of thousands of people for a common cause. And suddenly those are not puppies anymore. They, they grow into very powerful creatures. But again, our public workforce remains the same number of people. So the tension that the society pulls our public administration workforce in every which way has increased tremendously. And so the same old questions, how do we arbitrate? How do we reallocate? Soon becomes a lost cause. It becomes very difficult to convince any side of the other side's argument. And the more democratic a country is, the less trust it gets from its people. This is a worldwide trend. And so I think this question is very pertinent in the sense that uh, when we talk about social innovation or Xiaobei Chongxin, what we're talking about really is a different set of questions. Instead of asking what is fair or what is you know, safe, uh, keep people from hurting each other, we should ask instead, what is a new solution that works for everyone? Or if people cannot come up with new ideas, there's a win-win solution for everyone, which is innovation, but it's not always easy, right? At least we can ask, what are the common purpose? What are the common mission that we can all agree on? What are the non-controversial essence that everybody share the common value, even though their interests may differ? And if we keep asking these questions, the public administration becomes a space rather than a line in which all the different forces can join to solve common social problems. And so corporate social responsibility, or CSR, is a way for established, some publicly listed, very powerful private enterprises. And using their management, their um, innovation, their products, their services, sometimes they want to do it for social good. But this does not always uh, result in innovation because it has to be met by the civil society, by the charities, by the cooperatives, by the self-organized people, by the people who need those resources. And if they match in the middle, if the government plays our matchmaking powers right, they will form together into a real field that results in social innovation. So let me re repeat, a social innovation is a common purpose or a common mission. It is to solve a social problem, to create social impact. So a mission and an impact, and in the middle, something new happens, and that is social innovation. Um, the social enterprise is one particular kind of social innovation. It says, let's create a business model in the middle that solves social problems, that achieves social impact while becoming profitable in the process, while retaining our social mission. So, as you can see very clearly, this is not the same thing as corporate social responsibility. A corporate social responsibility is something that established companies do when they're profitable, they make their service and products and their time for social good, which is great. But a social enterprise is an entity that is formed with a mission. Whether they're profitable or not, it is an innovation, it is a journey to try to make a business model out of a common purpose, out of solving a social issue. If it fails, well, like any other innovation, uh, most innovations fail, <clears throat> somebody else afterwards can learn from the mistakes and the lessons. But if it works, then it becomes a replicable model. There's many social innovators in Taiwan in the past 20 years. They take all sorts of different organizational forms they may take the form of a cooperative, like this Homemakers Union Consumers Cooperative. They may take the form of a charity, of a foundation, like the Chu Jiang Ars Foundation. 
or they may take a form of a company with a social or environmental purpose, like the Lee Red Company here. And again, all of these are social innovators that has been around for more than 20 years. Evidently, their innovation in business model has succeeded at least for one generation, and those are our heroes in the social innovation area. And so, I think the answer, the quick answer to this question is, corporate social responsibility are like one arm, one branch from the force of the market that is waiting for the other part uh, from the charities, from the co-op, from the social um, side to meet in the middle. And once they meet in the middle, sometimes innovation happens. But this is never done by CSR alone. This needs to be done by the governing bodies, by the stakeholders around the environment, as well as by the social forces. Uh, in my mind, that is their uh, connection. And the government's role here, as this circle shows, is to solve problems for those problem solvers. We're not here to solve all the social problems ourselves. The social problems are so complicated now, they're so wicked now. A wicked problem is that to solve it, you require coordinated action from all the different players so it can be solved. If any one of the stakeholders refuse to commit, then you don't solve this problem. So this is what we call a wicked problem. And so our role here is to make sure that everybody knows what is going on. So I will spend another three minutes to talk through a concrete example, because abstract theories are great, but without example, they really mean nothing. Um, we have a bunch of designers um, they're very young designers um, who came up with this idea called Dian Dian Shan, a, a good, uh, spelled A-G-O-O-O-D, right? So a little bit of good. Uh, and the good team specialized in looking at the parts of the society that are disadvantaged, that are handicapped, that are marginalized. And we saw those people and think they are ruoshi, they are they're weak minorities people. And they find the part where they are actually superior, they are actually alpha, they are actually doing it better than you or me, and make them excel in this particular area. For example, this very cute um, rhinoceros, uh, this dog, this fish, uh, all these pretty um, illustrations are drawn by people with Down's syndrome or other development um, um, difficulties. So she had her uh, in Mandarin. Um, actually, the name she had her itself is a social innovation because before uh, people were calling them Zhi Zhang, right? Retarded or whatever. But just by calling them Xi Han er, it is a social innovation in itself. And a good team discovered that many of them are great painters. They have good muscle control, they have the body of an adult, but their mind are like children. And so they can draw illustrations that none of us can draw with such innocence. And so they engaged them in created illustrations. They also engaged blind people. There is a social enterprise that we connected to Taiwan. It's called Dialogue in the Dark, the Andehua. Dialogue in the dark takes place in a completely dark room and we run like consensus camp or training classes or interactive problem solving exercise in a completely dark room. And you and I will feel uncomfortable, vulnerable in a completely dark room. But our facilitator, our teachers, they're blind people. They're super confident in that environment. And so after two hours, six hours, spending with blind facilitators, our perception of what blind people can do changes a lot. It is a transformative experience. And so I could look systematically at handicapped people. And so this time around, they look at the street vendors uh, on wheelchairs, um, and we probably have encountered them already. Maybe they sell um, some chewing gum, maybe they sell some you know, paper or whatever, towels. But there are three 
difficulties from a sales design perspective. First, they don't have a business model uh, or elevator pitch. Uh, if you uh, ask them uh, what kind of work do you do, maybe they will interact with just very simple phrases like please do some good, right? But that limits the interaction we can do with them to a simple transactional purchase. But for the transactional process, their products are simply not cheaper than the selling love and just next door. And so people don't keep repeating the exercise of engaging them due to those three pain points. And so the point in social innovation, as I demonstrated, is to try to find all the different links from the environment, from the governing bodies, everywhere, and try to solve this common issue by engaging people who specialize, for example, in taking care of homeless people, taking care of people with handicaps, and try to coach them into professionally present themselves and be able to engage in sustained conversation. They also engage with social enterprises that specialize in transforming their wheelchair into a good mobile station that provides solar power that perhaps displays this um, LCD screen of interactive um, shells and when it's raining, the screen can also be folded to, you know, a uh, shield to become an umbrella for the, for the rain. And also they connect with local city government. For example, when Thailand City uh, pushes for fair trade, maybe they can get not just the big issue magazine, but also the fair trade coffees and tea and other special local goods, as well as any other specialties that, for example, maybe the Flower Expo in Taichung uh, will have their tourism uh, guided by these people. And finally, instead of just people they know and connect with, they also ask strangers, random strangers, on the internet through a platform called crowdfunding. So on the crowdfunding platform, they ask for this amount of money and very quickly get more than one million Taiwan dollars. But this funding is actually just a show of interest. So what people pay for is the chance to contribute, to participate with ideas. So people who provide their money also provide their time by saying, okay, perhaps in the places where there's no Taiwan hotspots, these people can serve as hotspots. If your mobile phone runs out of power, you can charge it at their station while they share their story with you over a fair trade coffee or tea. Or if it's raining, the mobile station can host many folded umbrellas and then in include more people with the uh, social connection by forming a kind of umbrella session for people who return their umbrella for more stories. There are many, many suggestions like this. And so social solidarity is built by asking a question. Can we reverse the relative disadvantage, social disadvantage of people selling goods on the street. So that's the social impact. If they're uniting under this common social purpose or social mission of trying to find the places where the disadvantaged people excel, that is a common purpose. And their business model innovation, there are many innovations and everybody can take part in the innovation. And so this is the concrete example. There's many forces here at play. There are CSR, like the Taishin Bank, donated the first prototype car. So that's their CSR, and they gained um, popularity, like being mentioned by me in this talk, <laughs> just by donating the very first car. But there are many other social enterprises and co-ops and charities at play here too. And all the illustrations, again, are done by the Xihamer Children of Us Foundation's um, people. And so I think this is a very good example to illustrate how corporate social responsibility can interact with social and corporate innovation. So that's a pretty long prelude. Let's see if there's some related or unrelated questions. Remember, you can ask anything and you can ask anonymously. Um, our colleague Huang Shiping would like to know, in order to solve societal problems, <coughs> Do you need, we need more social enterprises as well as social innovations since they seem to be more efficient 
yes, we need more people working on social innovations, including innovations on the business model, the social entrepreneurs. I think it's not only that they are more efficient, they are more agile. In the public service, we're providing this circle, right, this field. But this field, the size of the field, the budget of the field, the law and everything, traditionally, can only change about once a year, right? So just today, we're writing our national administrative direction, our Shizhen Fangzhen, that is for the budget of the next year. So we move in an iteration cycle that's roughly one year long which is good for stability and predictability and accountability, but it is not very agile. So when there is an emerging social issue, usually the government takes a year to fully form a plan to respond. So the social enterprises and social innovators can go to places where the government is not aware yet. They can surface problems that we're not aware yet. They can also deliver much more efficiently if we uh, allow their work to combine with our work. And so this is actually why we have this interesting space um, called the Social Innovation Lab. Uh, this is the first Social Innovation Lab in Taiwan, uh, it located in the uh, Taiwan Air Force Base, uh, the TAF Base, Kongzhou, uh, near the Jianguo Flower Market. Conveniently, it is about seven minutes walk from my place of residence, our minister's dormitory, to the uh, social innovation lab. It's just walking along the jingle market. So every once in a while, I just walk here uh, to work and walk back um, to the dormitory. So this place looks like this. Uh, and this um, soccer field is also drawn by the Xihanmer people uh, from the Chujara's Foundation and there's many different places. And this place is unique in the sense that none of these things that you see here is created or defined by the government. The government only provides the hardware and the budget. And we had a co-creation workshop with about 20 social enterprises. And the result, the conclusion of that workshop is that we need five more workshops. So in total, we had six workshops with hundreds of social innovators around Taiwan who suggested all the different things that we would not even dream about. They said we need to have a Michelin class kitchen with a resident chef because food is what people will remember. Ideas people don't remember, food they will remember. And so we have a resident chef, Shinalu, and uh, we have a top class kitchen and cafe. People said that we want the minister to be here one day per week. So every Wednesday from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. I'm in the Social Innovation Lab and in my office hour anyone can come talk to me as long as they are agreed to make the transcript public. They say many incubation places only open until 7 p.m. or 8 p.m. but the really interesting events only just starts around that time. So every day this opens until 11 p.m. well into the night. And so all this are asked and created and required by the social, social entrepreneurs. And this is like a blank canvas that really changes every week according to the need of the people actually inhabiting the space. And now Taichung starts to have two, uh, some three places like this. And over the course of next year, we'll have another two social innovation labs uh, in different parts of Taiwan preferably in non-metropolis cities. And so what I'm trying to get at is that when the people co-create a space, it becomes home to them. When people co-design how the space is used, it becomes a living lab. And what the government can do is, again, just to step back and say, we welcome creativity here, and all the creativity are allowed as long as it's made public and as long as accountable. So, after I started my office hour every Wednesday, it's been going on for about half a year now. Um, every week I meet with people all around Taiwan interested in the policy making process of social enterprises and social innovation. And together we did many laws and many regulations. 
we did the fintech sandbox law, uh, we did the part of the new company law, we did um, a lot of uh, the small to medium enterprise and startup law that still in the works, we did a platform economy law, we did a lot of laws together. But very quickly, after maybe one month into the office hour, I discovered something that is unsettling to me. I discovered that people who register for my office hour, they either live in Taipei or New Taipei City, or they live very close to the high-speed rail station. Otherwise, <laughs> the traveling, the time spent traveling to Taipei is just too much, uh, and people would not book for my office hour. Even though telepresence or Skype, or whatever, is possible, the initial contact, it really takes a first-hand contact to the field, to the uh, farmlands, to the indigenous tribes, to whatever actual social habitat they're trying to make innovation of, to fully understand their innovations. It doesn't work if they take like three hours of a Puyoma train and just bring me with this PowerPoint deck. It really doesn't work. And so um, I started making this tour of every other Tuesday. I travel to one of our um, direct service center, our united service center of the uh, central government in the different regions. And I make a promise to always return to the same point every two months. So the idea is that, for example, just um, this week, actually, uh, I visited uh, Hualien this Tuesday and talked with maybe a dozen or so of local social innovators and social entrepreneurs. But while I was talking to them and visiting their field, they have this excellent watermelon field that they're using drones to take pictures and count the number of watermelons, for example. Um, while visiting like this, altogether, there are about 20, 25 people in Taipei in the Taiwan Air Force Social Innovation Lab. And these are people from 10 different ministries, all related to social innovation. Um, actually, as of the last count, it's about 12 different ministries. And so what I'm trying to do is that I'm like an investigative reporter, a journalist. I'm the eyes and ears of the central government's ministries people. And I visit the social innovators. And I make sure that we also connect to the Taidong uh, University. So it's Hualien, Taidong, and Taipei uh, for this week. And what this results in is that because all the questions asked are transparently published online, people tend to make very focused conversations and answers and make the best use of each other's time. And whatever the central government <coughs> has the latest programs, latest policies, latest questions, and the latest development locally, like after the earthquake, uh, what, what should we do about the new travel plan and things like that, gets resolved very quickly. And so two weeks after this, we published a whole transcript for the next stop to use. And after two weeks after that, we published all the transcript for the next stop to use. And two months later, we return to the same spot. And by that time, all the questions from the previous round will have to be resolved. And so this is a new kind of a touring um, mechanism. Um, so yeah, this really works really well. Um, the teleconference equipment, Scopia, uh, is already purchased uh, during the SARS crisis, but nobody really uses it that much. Every year at the beginning of the Lunar New Year, the premier uses it to say greetings to everybody, but otherwise it's not used very much. But now we're using it very regularly and now has a pretty good high definition connection between those different places where social innovation happens and places where laws and policies happen. So we try to connect these two forces. And I'm very happy after um, our new premier, Lai uh, Xingde, came to office, he starts to do the, the same thing, right? Uh, touring around Taiwan, county by county, city by city. And after the first round of the uh, special budget and the long-term care plan, now he is during another round of touring, uh, the latest news says around industrial innovation, which is great. So um, I think this kind of mobile government really connects uh, and shortens the distance between the people and us, the public servants. And again, uh, going 
back to the first drawing, it, it was like this, not because the distance between the government and people have become larger. Um, people feel that we are um, of longer distance because the new social tools and mobile phones and so on make people feel closer to each other. So relatively, they feel more distant to the government. But we can also use the same tools to connect to people, to make them feel closer to us. It is not something that only the civil society and the private sector can do. We can use the same tools. And so once we use the same tools, the same sense of closeness returns. Um, our colleague Wang Chaoyun would like to know how to make public servants brave to innovate without fear of failure and bureaucratic control. You need a presidential letter. Uh, this is a, uh, one of the, the designs that we did um, this year. It's called the Presidential Social Innovation Hackathon. Now, some of you may have heard of hackathon and think a two-day, at most three-day, a weekend marathon of coding and collaboration. That is um, not really a marathon, it is just a sprint. Uh, this is a true marathon. This runs from March to June. So this is like three months. And so it's a real marathon. And what this is formulated is basically saying, so we have these presidential promises, right? Um, I for one voted for Dr. Tsai Ing-wen, and she kind of promised that she will make all these things get better. Um, and some of them did, some of them not, not really. So um, there's a lot of areas that we can work on that help the public servants, that's you and me, to deliver on those presidential promises, which means that it's our national focus, at least for the public service. And so uh, personally, actually, this is a, a project that I personally led uh, before I joined the cabinet. I'm still leading it. Uh, and what we do is basically working with the Ministry of Education to liberate all its different uh, dictionaries and try to make them into one useful dictionary, not just for the Mandarin Chinese, but also for Taiwanese Hakka, Taiwanese Holok, the indigenous language like the Amis, Bangza people, as well as for English, for French, and for German. And there are also many other civic hackers, uh, social innovators, who use data science to predict um, fire, to um, manage prevention, right? of domestic violence, of predicting uh, where and how the electric grid will be hit by that phone. There's many cases. And so what we're trying to do here is that we're asking teams to propose their ideas, and the ideas must be somehow connected to the public service. So these are the things that we're going to rank tomorrow. All our referees, our judges, are going to look at all these social innovations uh, and try to select 20 that we can come into this year. And we discover something very interesting. So, um, yeah, let's not look at me, I'm not really that interesting. So these people uh, discovered uh, something very interesting. Many of the proposed teams are actually cross-sectoral, in the sense that there is a sometime mid-level, Hujang level public servant. Uh, but they partner with the media, like the, the storm media or the Tianxia media or whatever other media people, press people, or they work with civil society organizations uh, like NPOs and charities. And so while it's sectoral, always the mid-level public servant that says that, okay, we're in a supporting role. We got contacted by these people uh, who are in the private sector or in civil society who want to make improvements. Uh, and these people are, of course, very capable, and they say, okay, we need data scientists, we need um, AI experts, we need maybe blockchain experts <laughs> to make this happen, for example. But I have discovered that actually all this looks very much like proposals in the public service. Maybe these are the proposals that have sat in the drawer, in the desk of that mid-level public servant for many years. 
because there is no political will, or there's no budget, or there's no cross-ministry communication, or there was just no, not enough time to refine the proposal into something that is feasible, that can ask the minister for budget. And so the public servants um, actually have a lot of very innovative ideas, but in the environment of a bureaucratic control, um, it is actually kind of hard to get the resources needed to make the innovation happen. And if it fails, it's tied directly into the career of the public servant. So it is actually difficult to propose. Um, but now the risk and credit benefit ratio changes, right? The risk is now absorbed by these people, right? They selected the social innovations for presidential um, promise. And the credit is shared with the people, including people in the public sector who propose these things. And so as long as the risk is absorbed by someone higher up, like the president, uh, and the political will is there, like from the president, to get the cross-sector and cross-ministry data and the team, and then the credit is shared. We find that even though this hackathon has no prize money whatsoever, right? Even if you are the, the final final five teams, all you get is this trophy, right? Well, and you can also join the um, New Zealand presidential, well, not really presidential, government hackathon, and that's one of the gifts we just got today. But, but there is no money, there is no uh, financial reward. But people still find that it's worth it to spend the time to propose these innovations. I think there's two incentives. First is the intrinsic incentive to try to make our land, right, our people better. And the second thing is that it gets you new, new, new friends because in your proposal you can say our department just don't have people with these skills. We want service designers, we don't have service designers. And this is a way to bypass the HR and recruit people and from all over the world actually. Uh, there's no limitation of the nationality. And to make new friends and have the president as your project manager to make these projects happen. And so this is one of the many, many uh, ways that we design to try to make it time-saving for public servants and risk-reducing for public servants and credit-sharing for public servants. And to my knowledge, if all those three um, concerns are addressed, there really is no barrier in the public service that prevents people from innovating. And so my office, the public digital innovation space, works completely in a voluntary way. We have around 25 full-time staff. Uh, we have around 35 interns all over Taiwan. So this is a kind of a big team, actually, 60 people. Uh, and in this team, anyone can pro propose any idea, just like in the hackathon. And they recruit each other to make it happen. And again, I'm just here to absorb the political risk if the innovation fails. And so this is our core value, by the way. So the PDIS core value is to build mutual trust between the government and the civil society. Our secondary value is to empower the civil society to be well informed and participate in public affairs. And equally important, we're here to simplify the administrative um, flow. And so based on these three things, uh, we think we can make innovation more easy for public servants and also spread the values through digital service. And so these values are, are not actually always consistent. They're sometimes in fighting with each other. There are sometimes tensions. But we have a rank, right? So this is always the most important thing. Um, and based on this, we have all those different rulings and regulations and things like that which results in all those artifacts in the green cards that you can see around here. And so there is a philosophy uh, behind the PITS team. And again, these are not my ideas. I'm just the, the one who writes post-it notes and organize post-it notes and ask my colleagues to come up with these ideas. And so again, this is a space for people to join. And once you're in it, we absorb the risk of innovation for you. Um, our colleague Pan Wei Ling would like to know, in my work, I meet NGOs. Sometimes it does not intellect. Maybe it's against the government. How do I balance our public image and the government's position? This is a great question. 
Um, so I will use one case to illustrate this. And this is not really an NGO. Uh, this is more like a um, UX designer. Um, but but they're, they're actually not for profit also. Right? They're a learning circle for designers who use MacBooks. Um, anyway, so they have this uh, organized kind of people who specialize in user experience. And last year, around May, um, as many of you know, our income tax filing software has failed the citizens. Well, for two hours, but uh, anyway, there was a misconfiguration that makes people like very slow to file their taxes. But people also discovered that if they use Mac or Linux, that is to say if they don't use Microsoft Windows, the technology that powers income tax for this platform called Java, Java Applet from, from Oracle, that makes Java run in the browser, is abandoned by the Oracle company. Because Oracle company did not come up with this technology. They bought it from the Sun Microsystems. So they, they don't want to maintain it anymore. And so suddenly, people cannot easily file their taxes anymore when they're on Mac or Linux. And this is a problem that is new. Because just last year, Oracle abandoned their technology. And so in the national petition system, join.gov.tw, we get this petition. Now some of you may know, the petition system says, once it reaches 5,000 people, we have to have a response to them. But in reality, by the time this gets 50 people, our participation officer in the Ministry of Finance, uh, Yang Qinghen, says, we've got to reply it now, even though it's just 50 people, because it's going to be a PR disaster. And then he was right. Um, it was a PR disaster. And it turns out that the very moment that he brings it to our participation officer network, there is a network of participation officers. This is a uh, regulation signed by Premier Lai Qingde that says in every ministry, we need to have officers just like Wu Wei Lian Luo Ren, the, the, um, the parliamentary officers, Xin Wen Lian Luo Ren, the media officers. We need officers who deal with this sudden outburst of civil power, right, of stakeholders. So these are called the participation officers, or POs, and they're from all the different skills. And most of the larger ministry now have a team of five to six people that works in this role. And so all the POs are on the same uh, chat room and on a mailing list and have a shared workspace. And so Jin Hans just said, you know, we've got to respond to them now. And we're like, okay. So we tell them, anyone who has a complaint, we will invite them to a co-creation workshop. And this co-creation workshop, we promise we will use exactly the word they used to complain about the tax filing system as post-it notes for improvement in this year's um, online filing experience. And so something magical happens. People used to complain. Uh, we have sentiment analysis software. So it used to be that 90% 90 pe 90 of people are angry. And only 10% of people on the joint platform are saying, but my experience is kind of OK. Well, you're in the strict minority. But once we propose this invitation for them to join this workshop, it suddenly reverses. Now, 80% of people starting putting out constructive criticism. Like, I want this to improve, I want that to improve. And only 20% of people remain, like, angry. So, just by inviting the people who complain the loudest to the kitchen, as we said, So, it, it, so it, it's not like we hand out candies to them. We hand out invitations to the kitchen. And so, they are invited to the kitchen to, to cook, right, for this year's uh, tax farming system. And we are true to our word. We use user journey. Uh, this is a service design concept to chart the journey from the beginning to the end of the tax filing experience. And we get people, uh, feedbacks, complaints actually, from the national petition system right into this chart. And we didn't change their words, right? We, we, we wouldn't come up with these words. Uh, and, but we collect them on the post-it notes here. And in the user journey, what's important in this thinking about solutions is the emotion of the user. Ideally, when we design an experience, when the user engages us more, 
their emotions should be lifting. They should feel much more focused, much more happy. But this system is special because somebody said, when I even think about filing our income tax, I don't feel well. So this is a, a, a we, we can't design a tax filing system that by the end of it you will feel better. It is actually impossible, but or very difficult. Uh, I'm happy to be proved wrong. But at least we can design so they don't feel very bad, right? We can design so they feel calm about filing income tax, and we will have succeeded. And again, after a live streamed co-creation workshop, the conclusion is that we need five more co-creation workshops. So we did five more co-creation workshops uh, with the vendor Wang Ma Wang Lu, uh, with the civil servants from Wuchui Bo Zhui Chu, uh, from preservation offices teams. Uh, we have professional facilitator conductors, and importantly, we have people who complain the loudest. And it turns out people who complain the loudest are actually expert designers, they're expert journalists, they're expert um, engineers, and they complain the loudest because they actually know better, really, they really know better. And so when we invited them in, we ended up creating something really like this, which is this year's text filing experience, which is very different and much more beautiful, I dare say, than the last year's text filing experience. But the best thing is not the system itself. Uh, together we found innovative ways to use cloud service systems uh, provided by the HiNet uh, government cloud service. So actually the cost of this system is negative because we save money by switching to a cloud-based system. Um, the budget is negative for this system. Also, we discovered ways to make it much more popular. And so based on the transparent recordings of those five co-creation workshops, all the people who participated, even if they just contributed one post-it note, they become our advertisers. They say, I so look forward to this year's text filing experience because that's their work. They will share it with their families and their friends. And you can't buy it, right? You can't buy this. It, only by true participation can you turn people who are just angry at the government and into improving the public image. You do it by making the public image part of their image. You bring their image into the public image. Um, our colleague Chen Meijing would like to know, why do you choose social innovation as a title to share with us this time? Are there any connection between your current job and the title? I'm glad you asked. Because if you look at the Zheng Wei Fen Kong Bia, the um, you know, um, table that lists the mandates of the ministries with that portfolio, I have only three mandates. And the first one is social entrepreneurship. Um, soon you will say social innovation. Right. So, so it's here, and starting from this year, so it's on scene. <clears throat> That's actually my main job. Uh, my second job, some of you know, is open government, which is why we have all these participation officers and regulations and the joint platform and, and all these things. And finally, I'm also in charge of youth empowerment. Uh, so we have the Youth Advisory Council, Qian Zixu Wei uh, and other uh, youth civic engagement purposes. And the Youth Council is great because actually the, present, the presidential hackathon was proposed by a Youth Councilor in one of the Youth Council meetings. And so it's such a good idea. And then we just asked the presidential office to make it a reality. And so all these three mandates kind of work together really well. We use open government to foster social innovation. The social innovation empowers the young people who can then engage in public service, who then churn out more social innovations. And so the social innovations uh, structure, which we're still co-creating, uh, will look something like this. Um, um, there will be laws and regulations. There's already laws and regulations. But there will now also be a task force. Uh, our Council for Sustainable Development, Yong Xu Wei, uh, will also be part of this. Uh, and also, um, as compared to the original social enterprise plan uh, from Professor Feng Yin, this time around uh, we're doing uh, the, the empowerment and the uh, immersion of sustainable development and social innovation by the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Interior. And we're also taking a very different approach 
approach to regulatory co-creation instead of the National Development Council or the Ministry of Economy saying, this is the law we need. They ask instead, what is the law that you want to see changed? This is the idea of a sandbox. I can go into this later. But yeah, this is a new for you uh, that corresponds uh, with new budget and new laws and regulations that will be our national social innovation plan. It will be ready in maybe a month for the premier to review. And every part of this is co-created by our round trip, by our office hour with the social innovators. So this is actually my main job now. So I'm really glad that you asked. Um, let's see other questions. So our colleague John Chiu would like to know how to use digital technologies in social innovation. Um, the answer is that you use it to promote social inclusion. Inclusion is a idea that I'm sure that many of you uh, already know. Sorry, it's not this particular thing. Right? It's this one. We have the the DigiPlus plan that uh, is a continuation of the, of the NISI plan. But the NISI plan um, was primarily focused on a stable infrastructure, broadband as a human right, connection to Wi-Fi by Taiwan, on the high-speed rails. These are very important. But uh, the new digital bus plan is much more cultural and was much more focused on sustainability this time pre compared to the previous NISI plan and which is why we call it the digital governance, right? The digital the governance model is digital in a sense that this really is a way not to take the existing analog paper services, but to reimagine services from the viewpoint of people and then recreate or co-create a smart nation uh, that is composed of many smart cities, I'm sure. Uh, and so this is the governing part. So we use digital tools to promote understanding in co-creating the governance. But in the two eyes here, the innovation part is where we say we, we cannot predict where the digital economy will go. So we will ask innovators, which part of the law and regulation would you like to challenge? And if you would like to challenge it, in the fintech sandbox already, we give them six months, 12 months to break the law, to try to break the law for social good. And if it ends up becoming a good idea, then the law and regulation change because the social inclusion is already taken care of in the immersion period of six months or 12 months. And if the society rejects it, it's not a good idea, then if the investors paid the expense for everybody to learn this lesson, and so the next innovation will take more care of people involved. So this is what we call a co-regulatory co-creation for the digital economy. And again, social innovation and a civil society plays a crucial role because when we use technologies, uh, we can use it in two ways. We can use it to bring people's attention on other people, like Slido. We use it to bring my attention to the question that most of you want to see answered. So it is a way to connect between people and people. However, technology can also be used in another way that is distracting, that makes people pay attention to some other things, trivial, personal, gaming things. But the game is not a, a public game. You can't share from it. So people become addicted to a private experience of in the digital world, but they take their attention away from other people. And that is the distracting technology. And the technology that enables people to connect more, we call it technology for social good, or calm technology, or ambient computing. There are many different civic technology. There's many words for this, but all they share is the idea of inclusion. By using technology, we connect more people who would not otherwise be here, like the Taichung people at the beginning of the speech. We use um, telepresence uh, projection right? uh, technology, live streaming technology, to bring their focus and our focus together. So as long as you deploy technology, you can always ask, 
before this technology is deployed and after this technology is deployed, does more people pay attention to more people? Do more people pay more attention to each other? And if the answer is yes, then it's inclusive technology. And if it's not, then it's exclusive technology. And when we deploy technology for social innovation, we always deploy socially inclusive technology that promotes access. So I promised I would stop around the you know, 50 minutes mark. And so let's take a 10 minute break and we will go back here uh, after 10 minutes and I will answer the rest of the questions. You can of course still and, uh, put more questions down there and I will take a quick look. So see you in 10 minutes. minister to answer it. And in this way, you can make innovations by having the minister 
bear the risk of innovation. And if you don't have friends in the control yet, maybe you can have friends with the examination yet. Uh, the examination yuan, uh, as many of you know, is um, the yuan responsible, the Chen Shu Ministry, uh, is responsible for our rules on uh, taking the absence, right? Uh, and so on the joint platform, while the examination yuan officially doesn't really have a participation officer, um, our chief of human resource, Ren Zong, um, is actually um, in ministry, right, in the uh, central government, and they have participation offices, and they're very good friends with the examination yet. And so because of this, whenever there's petitions like this, like changing the rule, um, so that uh, if you have, um, you know, uh, things to take care of, maybe your family, maybe your national travel card, um, and you don't have to take four hours of absence at a time, now you can take one hour of essence at a time and that becomes much more flexible. And as you can see, this is a very quick um, petition. Um, people, 5,000 people petitioned for it. All our participation offices are for it because we're all stakeholders. <laughs> and so very quickly, um, we contacted the rental people, contacted the petitioner, making sure that this is really what they want. And forward it to the um, examination yuan. And lo and behold, the examination yuan says, okay, we will ask the public if they have worries of the new rule uh, for 14 days. But after 14 days, we will make it a reality. So hooray, as, <laughs> as of this year, um, I think in early May or even in April, the rule has changed because of this petition. And the examination yuan uh, absorbed the risk of this innovation. Actually, all they want is a new cause, right? It's a yi uh, Previously, there was no um, initiative from either examination yuan to Renzo or from the administration to the examination yuan because nobody wants to be the risk taker to say we want this innovation. But now both sides can point to our participation offices as they voted for it. And our participation offices can say, no, 5,000 people want it, right? And so, so it becomes an issue for everybody. And so all the risk is absorbed and all the credit gets shared. And in this case, you can make a lot of innovations. Um, that is pretty zifei, actually. <laughs> it's, it's using the system for our uh, HR benefits, right? But the, I think this is a great example of trying to make innovation go through in a very quick and efficient way. And Convince the examination yuan that they are also benefactors, um, then they are also you know stakeholders in this. And so, if there's no existing law preventing you from doing it, it's just political risk. These are always ways to organize and overcome the political risk. And even if there is a law uh, that prevents you from doing it, you can always ask your friend to come to this National Development Council website and go to this. Uh, um, this uh, platform economy as well as others uh, suggestion. And this is very interesting because currently um, Minister Chen Lai head of the National Development Council, has this idea of um, legal interpretation. Uh, and this uh, new uh, principle says that if there's ever a ruling, a Han Shi, that says something is forbidden, for one particular case, for a good app, it must not extend to similar cases because we're not a case law country. Uh, if, if there are attempts to make it a common case, this interpretation should be abolished. Now, if there was a interpretation for a common cases, but actually the law and the regulations did not explicitly forbid it, then this interpretation should be abolished. And so um, I've never really heard any time in Taiwan's government's history of a head of NDC having this legal opinion. But this legal opinion is very useful for people who want to make innovations because all you have to do is challenge existing interpretations and convince your friend to go on this platform and say, you know, we want this regulation changed because it's blocking the way. And the NDC now has the KPI of every other week they review all the different ministries and see how many interpretations they can adjust or abolish under this new principle. So this is a, a political climate 
that is very favorable to people who want to challenge existing laws and regulations. So please make full use of it. <clears throat> and also, if it's just about procurement, um, uh, Minister Chen also asked the, the PCC, the Public Procurement um, um, Committee, uh, to relax the discretionary procurement. It was like uh, 100K. Uh, Taiwan dollars, Shiwan was the, the discretionary budget level, but now it is, I think, uh, Sunor is already uh, 1 million NT dollars. So the dis discretionary procurement has been a uh, um, tenfold increase in how you can use the procurement uh, like, uh, at your discretion. And also, um, we have a new procurement law amendment currently in the legislation. We expect it to pass this session because it's top priority. That says if you want to make the preferential bid, a, a, a bid based on value rather than the lowest price bid, you don't have to write an explanation anymore. You can just say, okay, this case is good for a value-based bid. And so all these combined, this interpretation principle, this new procurement uh, threshold, and the new procurement law says that it, you, you can be much more free with your procurement decisions and value-based procurement than the original uh, procurement law. So that is one of the changes that we uh, put in. And so, yeah, I understand that the public service is restricted in law, and uh, I'm very happy that I don't have to suggest to the Premier uh, of this problem because um, our uh, Chief Commissioner uh, of NDC um, is a uh, public servant with very long uh, experience in the public service, so she really knows which are the real pain points uh, that prevents the public service from innovating. And so she's been very systematically uh, to try to relax these things. And if there are parts that you think uh, she and her team missed, please uh, ask your friend to go to the National Duma Council platform and let them know how it. Uh, <clears throat> our colleague Xian Meili would like to know what role should the government play in the social innovation process. Um, in my personal view, and it is a personal view, um, we should play the role of problem solvers, of the people who are problem solvers themselves. Uh, and this is a role that we can play in the sense that it is a role that nobody else can play. Um, because as the previous question asked, all those issues blocking the innovators from innovating, many of them are regulatory in nature. Many of them are interpretative uh, principles of the law. And the local governments and the central government may not, not always align. And even in the local government, the barrier of economic development and the barrier for social affairs may not always agree. And so our government, what we can do is to assemble a cross-ministry, cross-bureau, cross-level team that goes around all the time, that has this internal connection, and that knows when something happens, who to ask. So our platform, the se.p.tw, um, lists all the resources that all the ministries offers to all the social innovations. We list um, registered social enterprises, be they co-ops, charities, or companies. We uh, took those services provided by social enterprises that let us learn more about social innovation and social inclusion and put them into um, procurement, our common procurement, Gontong Cycle. Um, and we also have counseling services as well as, as I mentioned, the public touring um, that you can review the transcripts and hold me to account in the sense that you can go through all the questions asked in the previous rounds and get a response and the full transcript of what has been asked by the social innovators. And finally, you can review the list of services and uh, goods that are um, re demanded or required or supported by 10 different ministries. So what sustainable development goals that they are trying to do this year around and what kind of resources that um, you know, people from the social innovation sector can make use of. And all this, we do it in the responding to need 
kind of way. So anyone can go through all these programs and suggest changes, and many already do. And so all this is updated every two weeks. And so again, I think we need to be a um, circle in which people can join rather than a arbiter, like a line uh, that, that uh, takes tension from the civil society. If we can stick to the role of a field that people can open and transparently um, find their common purposes and find the common values that they care about, then we can uh, rest assured that the trust problem can be solved because people will trust us as the keeper of the field, but not in any particular stake. Um, our colleague Chou Yuxuan, Chou Yuxuan would like to know, in order to innovate the social industries or social enterprises, how can we public service apply innovative ideas into our governmental and official systems? Um, that, that's a great question. Uh, I think one of the Peter's role here is just to try to uh, demonstrate that people can and will use innovative tools if it saves our time, if it reduces our risk, and if it shares the credit. So, as a concrete example, um, this year, as I mentioned, we engaged with 35 um, interns. They're all young people, they're all university or college level people, and they're all around Taiwan. Uh, we do this by combining the internship program offered by the Youth Development Agency, Qinashu, and the teleworking directive, Yuan Ju Lao Dong Fan, as prepared by the Ministry of Labor. Previously, nobody really connected these two together, but we did. And once we did, um, we did something that's great, because uh, it engaged more young people, and the young people can engage more young people on our behalf. And so, what, what really happens is that we have this website called ray.pdstw that engage anyone who has anything to say about government websites and who want to collectively debug the government websites. And we announce them, and then we select them, we interview them, and then we start the plan. And after we started the plan, we asked all these people to look at all those government websites, like all 508 of them, and file bug reports. And one part of them, one third of them, look at those bug reports and then fix them. And so for the public servants involved, this is the first time that young people here are not complaining. They're fixing the problem. They come up with solutions. They're not just coming up with complaints. And for the young people who specialize in public administration, design, or engineering, it is their chance to prove their worth to the uh, public servants that they can contribute to public service and engage in the public design process. And after we did this uh, pilot run last year of 15 people, this year we do 35 people, but five of them are mentors from the previous year. And so we don't even manage the program anymore. All this program is managed by the people who enrolled uh, last year. And so the students now take care of the students and we don't have to do anything. Uh, now this year we take care of all the mobile phones and websites that are responsively designed for the government websites and services. And after those uh, young people fill in their suggestions, we then collect those suggestions into the government digital service principle. And the government digital service principle Again, it is uh, publicly uh, deliberated on the joint platform, expresses the idea that we should value user experience across discipline mechanism, sufficient resources, part of the, the um, accountability, the importance of user studies, inclusion, multi stakeholder, and most importantly, that the frontline public service staff are also users. Their ideas should be included in the very beginning when we're designing the system for their experience as well as other people's. And the young people suggested that we need someone like the minister um, to absorb all the risk. And so this is not found in many other countries' uh, government digital service plan. This basically says once we have a cross-discipline, cross-departmental team, we need someone to absorb the risk. 
Uh, and so this is, will soon, after a couple of months, become an official regulation in the DigiPlus plan. And after that, uh, the NDC as well as the MIS people of all the different cities will adjust their procurement and their system building regulations based on the government digital service uh, principle. And the GDSP, as I mentioned, is done by taking those innovations that we participated with those teleworking interns all around Taiwan working at their school, working at their home, and collaboratively co-designed this um, experience and this principles. So I don't have time to go through all the principles, but as many of you can see, it included many of the best practices that are intended not to just simplify the citizen's experience, but also make our life better, to make our life not to be locked in by vendors, to make our life easier by having the public uh, doing the creation process with us instead of just us for them. So this is one of the core uh, ideas in the government digital service principles. And so all these are innovations, but once they turn from innovation to production, what we need, as I mentioned, is a way to translate this into regulations and into policies. And that's our core competence. We, we still do that, but we source the innovation from many different forms, from strangers on the internet, from young people who enroll in our internship program, from people we don't have normally connection with, from people who snowball and invite other people. As long as we keep a level playing field and turn their suggestions, their complaints into productive suggestions, we can include more and more people in the early stage brainstorming process. As long as we make it clear it's brainstorming, nobody will really flip the table or block the process. We're just brainstorming here. Our colleague Kwame Jo would like to know, um, if the social enterprise were so efficient, why are we still working here? Well, um, <laughs> as, as many of you um, know, um, my, my personal uh, political belief is that of anarchism. Uh, and I, I say it in English, but in the local culture it is more like Taoism, which to me is the same thing, right? Uh, so uh, the idea, very simply put, is that I never issue one single direct command to anyone against their will. Anyone I work with, I work with voluntarily. And if people uh, say, no, that's not the best idea, I always yield to them. They could be my colleagues, they could be my um, you know, friends, they could be people in the civil society, it doesn't matter. Um, I'm, I'm a minister with a portfolio, meaning that I don't really have anyone reporting to me. All, all of you are my colleagues, and to me, I'm not your uh, superior. So the idea, very simply put, is that if you find me useful in reducing the risk, if you find the technology useful in saving your time, you're always free to take it and run with it. And if people complain about it, you can always say, oh, it's Audrey's idea, she's crazy. But on the other hand, uh, I'm around so that people can focus on each other's contribution more. And I make it much more apparent, for example, by the joint platform, where very soon, people, like in a week or two, everybody can see all the work that you're doing and all the projects that all the different ministries are working on and all the procurements, all the spendings, all the KPIs, everything, right? So this idea is that anything that the National Development Council can see on their GPN net we're making it completely public. We've already made it public for a year for the uh, administrative level Yuan Guan uh, project, but starting next month, we're making everything public. And for, for doing this, there was a lot of fear, a lot of uncertainty and doubt among our participation office and network. They, they were like, ah, oh, people will just flood the system, we will get one call by everybody, not just two people. And, and so on. But it turns out people re really care and they, they make useful contributions. And they only have to answer the question once. They don't have to answer the question one million times uh, from you know the MPs, the superiors, and whatever. They can just provide a URL. There's one example that I really like to use. It's the Qingmen Bridge example here. 
So this is, has been already public for more than a year now. And this looks very reasonable, right? This is a serious project, it's a monthly reported and so on. It's a you know engineering project. But if you look at the cumulative spending, um, it looks like this. But it is cumulative, right? It should only increase. It, it should never decrease. That's what cumulative means, right? Late means it just grows. Right? So this picture is, is very interesting uh, from a KPM perspective. Um, so, so there's someone, a guest account, anonymous, asked a very useful question. Now their spelling is, is not perfect, but everybody can understand what the quest, this question is trying to say, even though the spelling um, can use some improvement. Um, but, I mean, the, the administrator here made a really good response. I'm sure that they have already answered this to the members of the parliament or their superiors, or the control unit, or uh, the National Development Council, or the Board of Science and Technology, or, or the PCC. Uh, there's like five different kinds of people who can ask you this kind of question that you have to answer. It's, it's very tedious. Uh, but now, you, when you answer it publicly, next time, anyone can just Google it. People in control unit, they send me this private email over PTT saying that I'm making your life much easier. They don't have to, to, to um, har harass to, to trouble the public servants so much because they can just engage in this public Q&A around a specific budget item. And we do have pretty good moderators. You don't get many trolls here. So you, we don't overconsume your time. The petitions used to consume a lot of public servants' time. But now we only ask your opinion of rejection or not after there's 1,000 uh, petitioners. So we're improving the process. And now the participation authors are feeling confident enough so we can publish everything uh, here on the joint platform. And once we do that, again, we take that innovation into production and reorganize the social trust based on this new organization. So the government always plays the role of taking those innovations and making it very well known, not just um, in Taiwan, but internationally. Every time I go to international conferences, uh, I went to like four United Nations meetings now. Uh, in the four meetings, all I talk about is sustainable development goals because it is what the entire world is concentrated on. And all our contributions, all those publicly accountability, digital governance, social innovation system, is right there in SDG 17. Because the 17th SDG is about connecting the different forces in the society to work in a way that improve um, the SDGs without sacrificing any other SDGs. And so the, all this system is very useful to other democratic countries as well. And so we are making the digital governance part of our diplomatic direction of um, this year. And so this is great because um, everybody is working on this. So a lot of efforts we can also incorporate internationally. So our presidential hackathon one of the winning teams is now uh, endorsed uh, by the New Zealand government and they can join to improve the civil servant's life in New Zealand. Or they can connect to the network around Asia and having people gather in Taichung this May and to share the social innovations, translate everything to English and then to spread these ideas around Asia as well as bring more power and energy into here. So at the moment, the government still plays a role. But as I said, it's the Taoist and anarchist role that just connects people. That is like water and good for everything. And go to the low, low some places and then find a way. And then I think that is the role that we should play as water, as um, the pool uh, of where the creativity can flow. Um, the colleague Taich and Zhe know. Uh, just for fun, combining both things to make new things. I have a pen, I have an apple, connected. Sustainable development goals. Really, the, the pineapple uh, guy recorded a, a hilarious video for the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And yeah, it's like I have a pen, I have a textbook, combining education. I have a pen, I have apple, connecting no poverty or whatever. Right, so, uh, so it is uh, actually a, a pretty hip thing to promote this UN Sustainable Development Goals using whatever art form possible. 
our colleague Zhu Jianghui would like to know does the activity of such an inquiry require a timely intervention of government to ensure the quality of implementation? Again, a great question. So, in our current um, company law, if a social enterprise chooses to be incorporated as a company, they face the challenge of the current company law that says in its first article, Gong Si Ying Li Wei Mu the purpose of a company is to make a profit. Uh, but now, the new company law, as well as the reinterpretation of the existing company law signed by, by the Ministry of Economy Affairs, now says, no, but you may also declare that your social environmental purpose is as important as making a profit or even more important as making a profit. You can say in your company founding document, your junction, in your charter, saying all the revenues, all the profits we make will completely be reinvested into the social purpose and the um, shareholders never get anything more back than the original investment they make. This is what we call the Yunus style, Professor Yunus style social business. And so if a company wants to do that, they can now legally do it. They legally can just declare this in their founding documents. And the Ministry of Economy and Affairs provides a public open data listing of any company that chooses to signal to their investors, to their market, to their stakeholders that they have a social purpose and they're committed to it in this and that way. We don't say they have to publish their public benefit impact report every two months or three months or half a year or a year. They say it themselves in the charter. We don't say that they have to provide all their revenue, half of their revenue, 30% of their revenue back into the social mission. Again, they can declare that themselves. And the independent analyst can ask the database and say, OK, how many companies are there now committed to this social purpose? And we're now also making it possible so that charities, even Shihan Fire, even association, voluntary associations, they can also form sub-companies as long as they control it through the closely held resource company law, through special voting rights, through its mission lock. So the purpose of the charity must be the same as the purpose of the company. And finally, the purpose uh, document, uh, the public beneficial uh, report must be published together. So if they have the same mission, they retain control and then publish the accountability report together, then we say, okay, this voluntary association can own a sub-company and engage in the investment market. And so all this, again, is intervention. But this is intervention to make more room. This is not intervention to point to a, any direction. This is intervention to say, now choose your own direction, but make sure everybody knows about it transparently. So this is the kind of intervention that we intervene uh, every other week, actually, and every week during the office hours. So, um, <clears throat> our colleague Emily would like to know about social issues such as homeless people around the park or subway. Do you think how to create social innovations to solve them? Yes, we do. There are many social innovations um, around creating uh, a, a place for the homeless people, solidarity for homeless people, and so on. Um, well, you're, you're welcome to look it up in our uh, database, but um, in the original example that I showed, that a good example, actually their pattern of empowerment is the do you a flavor. And do you a flavor specialize in social solidarity of homeless people and um, connect it and into the larger social supporting system. Um, and so, yeah, you're, you're welcome to, to uh, connect to these people and understand how they do it. Um, and I, I'd like to tell a uh, short anecdote, a personal story. Um, when I look uh, to redo my hair, I choose the only social enterprise haircut salon uh, that, that's public advertised. They're called Hao Jian Cai. Uh, Cai is the talent. Cai is the Cai, right? And this social enterprise, uh, Hao Jian Cai, is very interesting because uh, the, the person who washes uh, my hair uh, she is from Hainan, and she said she learned about uh, hair haircut. Uh, she's a hairstylist by training, but she only looked. She looked at all those different uh, human resource requirements on 104. 
but she only uh, sent her resume to this one single social enterprise. So if this one turns, turns her down, she's not going to Taipei, right? But she went to Taipei for the social enterprise because it is more like a cooperative. All the people who wash hairs get weekly trainings and gets promoted to designers once they pass a independence verification of their um, capability and they get um, a, a good career path. Uh, and it's better than the labor law. Uh, but in, in addition to that, they work with homeless people. They work with migrant workers. They work with people who cannot very easily fit with the community and do haircuts for them. They, they make their hairstyles so that they feel more confident. And while they're waiting for their hairdo to be completed, um, in exchange, they ask them to tell their stories and swap the stories around and share the stories to the community participants so that people get to understand each other more. So it is for a social solidarity purpose. And for this, for this social mission, uh, she goes to Taipei and joins this team of social entrepreneurs. So any kind of business um, could be turned into a social enterprise if you think in terms of what's the common good and what's the common purpose. Um, and so our colleague Fu would like to know how do we support social innovation to be sustainable? In truth, most of the innovations fail. And we can support sustainability by praising people who fail and share their stories. This is the idea of the triple button line uh, entrepreneurship. Um, some of you may have heard of the idea of unicorns in startup world. It means that someone, um, a company that is valued very expensively by the uh, investor market. But in the Silicon Valley, the unicorns are not really very trendy anymore. Because unicorn, through their work, sometimes create externalities that create social problems. So there's a new bunch of entrepreneurs that brand themselves as zebras. And zebra, Batma, right, has the white part that is the for-profit part, but the black part, that is for the hidden, for the social good part. So it's a kind of yin and yang play. So it is an uh, enterprise with a social purpose. It is one kind of, of uh, business for the benefit of all, in addition to the benefit of shareholders. And so these zebras, have, we have a way to engage with them actually more than we have with unicorns. We are now having some way to engage with unicorns, I'm happy for that. But we actually, as public servants, we have our social missions too. We have our annual social missions. We have our KPIs to, to, to worry about. But if those zebras in their black part overlap with our mission for the year, then we can collaborate them in a lot of different ways. Um, and actually, that's the list that I show you. All those, those different 10 ministries listed explicitly what kind of zebras they're trying to work with. And that creates a positive feedback loop, and that creates um, trust, so that even if they fail, as long as they share why they fail, they can be funded again. And the uh, National Development Fund, the SBIR, SBTR, SIR fund, uh, we will all make room for people who fail repeatedly, but they have genuinely a good idea for social innovation. And so that's um, the current answer. How do government use big data to find out who needs help? This is great. Um, I, I really think um, by the uh, presidential hackathons uh, final round, we will have a lot of very, very good examples. But now you can already look at one, uh, any of those 100 cases and think about next year's application, actually. We want you to participate. And so there, there's, there's many here that use big data, that use data analytics uh, to uh, propose a way for people um, to engage each other more effectively through visualization, through data integration and things like that. So yeah, I don't have time to go through the 100 cases, but suffice it to say, at least half of it involves using data analytics, big data or not, uh, to identify the people who we can focus more uh, with our resource in the public service. Our colleague Chen would like to know, what are their social innovative enterprises here in Taiwan? We'll be glad to learn some. Does making money not important? Well, making money 
is the instrument, right? It is the means to sustainability. If you lose money for a very long time, you're not sustainable anymore. So making money is the, the tool, the instrument for sustainability. But it is not a goal in itself. The goal, again, is to achieve a social mission, to have a social impact. And if you would like a tour of the current uh, social enterprises that we know about, again, in sdapides.tw, you can go to this registry and look up in any of those service areas and in any of those fields, in any of these um, districts or counties, and discover what they care about and what they want to do. And so, yeah, um, I will not make any special advertisement for any one of them, but suffice to say that they spun all parts of the country and all parts from urban to rural and all parts of the sustainable development goals. So, yeah, welcome to uh, look at look them up at sedapides.tw. And I think we did that, the government's problem. So, and finally, an anonymous question. Um, there are many open source organizations. How does public servant interact with them to improve government and open source NGO efficiently? So, <clears throat> open source, broadly speaking, means that we give up part of our copyright so people can copy our work and change it without asking for permission. This is a legal way of saying you can make changes without asking me. There are many different kinds of open source. Uh, personally, I use the Creative Commons Zero, which means uh, there's, you don't even have to say it's my work. You can take the Meng Dian away and say it's, it's your work, and I will never sue you for anything. So this is completely abandoning of copyright. But not many uh, communities do that by default. Many companies uh, and communities says you have at least to say who was the original author. It's like citation, right? Uh, but then you can make anything on it. And so the way to engage open source organizations is always find a community behind it. Like in the GovZero community, we have a lot of hackathons. And so every week we meet, um, every Wednesday evening at the Social Innovation Lab here in Taipei. So you're welcome to join us. And you can find all the, our, our meetings and gatherings of any open source organization. And many of them will have an online channel. So you can also come by and say hi. But always, I think, just participating in those large hackathons, in those um, large meetings like Coast Cup or um, the MobCon or many other conferences uh, is a great way to start making friends. And because open source really is just an excuse for us to make new friends and to have delicious food. And so <clears throat> just um, if you're just doing it for the technology and missing the social connection and the food, well, you're missing out a lot. And so, yeah, I would uh, definitely encourage people to build uh, personal connections in addition to technological connections. So, um, our colleague Sun Shiwan, maybe we'll drop by some Wednesday to the DAF. Uh, yeah, so please drop by and um, let me know. And <clears throat> how do you think about the relationship between the customer's big data to improve social service quality? Now, this is a, a great question. Um, for me personally, there is no uh, problem of using the aggregate data or statistics data for social good. What is a problem, of course, is to use somebody's data without them knowing about it. So, in my mind, public use of data, the open data, and the data with my <laughs> private um, issues and details, these are two distinct concepts. These two circles do not overlap. So when you say big data, I have always to, to, to ask you, do you mean a trend analysis based on statistics and data that could be open? Or do you mean you have some algorithms that must be run on the raw data that con contains my privacy? If it is the latter part, then I would ask you to publish the code, to publish the algorithm and let the experts review that really it does not hurt people's privacy. And anyone deserves to know when their personal data is being analyzed like this. And so the data controller, the ministry, runs the code, maybe publishes the result as statistics data, but it must never 
just published the raw data of personal information. For me, it is a idea of right, of freedom from surveillance, from coercion, from censorship. It is an idea of negative liberty. So the idea is that our privacy is a right and it is not some asset or some data um, that could be treated as property. <coughs> we, we saw <coughs> some people who want to treat this as property and the uh, Cambridge Analytica thing, everybody knows about it now. So if you think of personal data as property, that is what you get. And if you think of your privacy as a kind of freedom uh, from temporary, then it is a much more sane way to treat each other's data. And so in the personal privacy protection, uh, very soon uh, we will be party to the APEC countries uh, cross-border privacy protection rules. And we're also looking into joining the European Union's GDPR system. And so that will allow for a much more um, coordinated way to handle the privacy issues across those different areas. So I will take one final question. How can government instill more policy to encourage social innovation? In my mind, uh, I work with social innovators all the time, and they ask the government not to think for them, but think with them. With the sandbox rule, again, in our work as public servants, if somebody comes with, with a very good innovative idea, but it potentially could be interpreted as against the law, our if we approve it, we have to write some document and get and signatures. So it's the cost of time, maybe a couple of days of time, to allow this innovation. But if we just reject it, it costs us nothing. We just say no. Right? <clears throat> so this is less time consuming. <clears throat> but with the fintech sandbox, with the AI vehicle sandbox, with new sandbox rules, this relationship changes. If an innovation comes and you approve it as legal, then it just costs you two or three days of time. It's still time, but you can spread it around with other innovators once you have social connection with them. However, if you reject it, it will enter a sandbox, and then you have to spend half a year with this idea and write more paperwork. And so the sandbox laws is fundamentally changing the attitude of first the fintech community, next the AI community, and more communities in regards with the members of the parliament and member in the public service. Because now it is actually easier if we can say what the law does not forbid is legal. And it is actually easier for us to say if you really have to challenge a law, we'll do it publicly through a sandbox instead of doing it in the black market or in the green market. So with that, I hope um, our social innovators don't have to register their company at the Cayman Islands. They don't have to place their computers at the public sea. They don't have to hide uh, their transaction records in the dark uh, web. They don't have to invent, uh, you know, very uh, weird uh, private blockchain protocols in order to evade taxation and auditing. With this kind of new policy that we co-create with social innovators, we hope that they come to the light and co-create the environment with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Tom. Thank you for your excellent sharing. Let's give a warm applause again. Thank you. to the end. Thank you for your participation today. Please remember to use an ACS app to fill in today's questionnaire. Our next class will be on April 12th. Okay, uh, some colleagues still use uh, your English name to, uh, to submit your English question today. Uh, we are looking for these colleagues. Michelle, Albert Wong, Wen Xin Zhang, Jay,